then the journey begins. It's a beautiful experience to be in a Catholic enriched environment, in a faith that's lived. Christ chose fishermen to give us the foundation of our faith, the gospel. Father Joseph Leo Iannucci is a doctoral alumnus of the Gregorian Pontifical University. He has obtained five postgraduate degrees with studies in medicine, anthropology, sociology, philosophy, and theology. Having achieved state championships in violin and wrestling, be careful with your questions with Father Godin. Father Joseph studied medicine and traveled to a Marian Shrine in 1988, where he was inspired to enter the seminary. In 1991, he obtained a BA in philosophy and was awarded the Kilburn Award. While assigned for 15 years in Italy, Reverend Iannucci he studied Italian, Hebrew, Greek, Latin, and other languages. He also obtained a BA, STL, STD, PhD in theology, with his specialization in patristics, dogmatics, and mysticism. Father Inucci was one of four selected students to receive a grant from the Pontifical Biblicum University of Rome to study theology in Israel. While in Rome, he assisted the exorcist of Rome, Father Gabriel Amos, and has written several books on prophecy and revelation. He appeared on EWTN and was host of several television and national radio broadcasts. He has translated numerous theological works into English and has authored five publications. Father Iannucci's first exposure to the writings of the Italian mystic Luisa Picaretta occurred over 20 years ago while making a holy hour in a Trappist monastery. By a stroke of providence, there lay on an empty pew before him a volume of Luisa. After having read it, he discovered on the monastery windowsill a pamphlet of the same mystic. The following day, a senior nun, now deceased, approached him and asked if he might be interested in translating Luisa's work from Italian into English. He accepted this task. In 2012, Father Iannucci successfully completed his doctorate in theology at the Gregorian Pontifical University of Rome and he has translated into English all of Luisa's writings that are cited in his doctoral dissertation. So sisters and brothers, let's welcome Padre Joseph Iannucci. I wish all that were true. <laughs> Thank you to Epifanio and his wife and the other two self proclaimed angels. <laughs> Narisa, thank you for coordinating the retreat. It's a beautiful experience to be in a Catholic enriched environment. I mean a faith that's lived. What I would like to do is avail myself of your faith by helping nourish it, root it, within the doctrine that Jesus himself provides his church with through Louisa. He provides his church with the doctrine of living in the divine will through an unlettered almost peasant 
Italian girl, he might fill her with his doctrine only. Oftentimes, the Lord uses simple instruments like fishermen to promote his gospel message. So the Lord is attracted by our wretchedness. I don't mean deliberate sinfulness. I mean our inability, our ineptitude to do anything good. Anything we receive through our own efforts, whether it's studies or sports or administration, whatever it may be, is ultimately God's gift because he disposes the people we meet, the places we go to, the occasions that present themselves. When we are all baptized, we're given two gifts. The gift of the Holy Spirit himself, which is God, inseparable from the Father and the Son, and the gifts of the Holy Spirit, known as the charisma. So each of us is given from conception, but they are given as gifts, meaning we did nothing to merit them. What we do in life is develop them. With that in mind, let us begin with the complementarity of public and private revelation. Christ chose fishermen to give us the foundation of our faith, which is known as the scriptures, the New Testament in particular, the gospel. And this preaching of the apostles is known in Greek as kerygma ton apostolon, the Easter proclamation of the apostles, because it began after Christ resurrected, Easter Sunday. After this resurrection and after this message was preached and written in a normative form called sacred scripture, other post-biblical revelations occurred. We call them private revelations. So the revelations of today's feast day, the Sacred Heart, come from a French mystic named Saint Margaret Mary Alacoque. These are private revelations that the church sanctioned and incorporated within its martyrology. So we celebrate every year as a solemnity, the feast, the solemnity of the Sacred Heart from a private revelation. St. Faustina Kowalska received revelations for a great feast day, the first Sunday after Easter, known as the Feast Day of Divine Mercy. Karol Wojtyla, Archbishop of Krakow at the time, reviewed these writings that were at one time on the index of prohibited books. He rehabilitated them, approved them, and then when he was coronated pontiff, made through these writings that feast day of mercy a universal feast in the church because our lord told faustina in these writings i want this feast day to be proclaimed throughout the church why because whoever goes to confession and communion the first sunday after easter receives of what's known as a plenary indulgence means a total remission of all sin and punishment when you are baptized as a child or as an adult All your sins and the punishment of all your sins that remains to be expiated in purgatory is done away with. If you die immediately after baptism, you go straight to heaven without any time in purgatory. However, if you go to confession, another sacrament, the punishment is not taken away, just the sins. The sin is taken away so you can go to heaven, but you may have to go through purgatory due to the punishment due to those sins. On the feast day of mercy, the first Sunday after Easter, all sin and punishment is taken away. It happens once a year, the feast day of mercy. And that gift comes through a private revelation. That's how important private revelations, when authenticated by the church, can be. Then we have the private revelations of Luisa Picaretta. And she, too, received private revelations from our Lord that bring us to the knowledge of the gift of living in the divine will, which he tells her is the greatest gift that God could ever give the human race. It completes the work of redemption in the sense that Christ in himself completed everything. And public revelation, which is the proclamation of Christ and the apostles, contains everything we need for salvation it is complete but even though it is complete in Christ and in scripture it remains for the centuries to fully grasp the significance of this let me refer you to article 66 of the Catholic Catechism of the Church it states no new public revelation is to be expected before the glorious coming of our Lord Jesus Christ yet even if revelation is already complete It had not been completely explicit. It remains for the Christian faith gradually to grasp its full significance over the course of the century. Public revelation that Christ and the apostles give us is complete in itself, but we don't fully grasp it. Through theological contributions, through prophetic revelations of mystics, bring out in an explicit manner that which was seen previously only in seminal form. 
now it's explicated. Well, similarly, private revelation serves like a magnifying glass. It doesn't add anything to public revelation, but it brings out some of the richest treasures, spiritual, doctrinal, that we've not even had a clue of or had only implicit knowledge of for centuries, if not millennia. This is the case with Louisa's revelations. The gift of living in the divine will was in Jesus Christ. He possessed it. It was in Mary. She possessed this gift. It was in Adam and in Eve before their fall. So fiat, Latin word, that means may it be so. When God created the universe, the Latin version of the Old Testament, written by Jerome in the fourth century, reads, when he created light, fiat lux, let there be light. When Mary was approached by the angel Gabriel and asked if she would be the mother of God, in Latin she said, fiat mihi secundum verbum tuum, be it done to me, fiat, according to your word. So when God created the world, he said fiat to each of the five days of creation. And then on the sixth, he made man and woman in his image and likeness. The son, when he came to earth, said to his heavenly father, who desired that he come to save the race, fiat, let it be done. And then the Holy Spirit, in recent years, with the gift of living in the divine will, is now saying to us, fiat, may the gift that Adam and Eve possessed before original sin, that Jesus and Mary possessed, who had no sin, be actualized in all human nature. The time has come. But I will explain to you what exactly that entails, what it means to live in the divine will, and what that gift was like when Adam and Eve possessed it, when Jesus and Mary possessed it, and what it will be like when we possess it if we do not yet already possess it. Adam and Eve were created as the most perfect creature God could ever create. Man and woman, human nature, is the greatest work in the material order God could ever create. From all eternity, God chose to become one of us. When God made Lucifer, he allowed Lucifer to have a vision of Christ, the Son of God's future incarnation. Lucifer, driven with envy, said, I will never allow a God I worship to assume such a poor, lowly human nature, inferior to our intellect. I will not serve this kind of plan. So Lucifer took a third of the angels with him, and they tried to overthrow God and his plan. They wanted God to be one of them, not a human being. So God, to humiliate Lucifer for his lack of obedience and trusting in God's plan, decided that Michael, an inferior angel to Lucifer, should defeat him. So Jesus relates in scripture, I saw Satan fall like lightning from the sky. Lucifer became Satan, and he was sent to hell, along with the angels, some went to dark regions from where they tempt us. And in the book of Job in the Old Testament, we find Satan roaming the earth. And God says to Satan, what are you doing? He says, oh, just prowling the earth looking for someone to tempt. Have you seen my servant Job, how faithful he is? And then he started to tempt Job. God allowed him to test him, just like he allowed his son to be tested in the desert three times. So this was the beginning of the end of plan A. Plan A was to have the angels, including Lucifer, and all the other creatures that would come after him, including man and woman, living in perfect harmony together. So then we come to the Garden of Eden. Lucifer finds his way there too. Who did Lucifer approach? Eve, not Adam. Why? I'll tell you why. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm being serious now. <laughs> if you read Genesis chapter 2 verse 16, God tells Adam, not Eve, not to partake of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He never tells Eve this in sacred scripture. Satan, knowing that Adam was told directly by God, he approaches Eve. And what does he say? Did God tell you that? And what does she say? You know what? You're right. He never did. She sows a doubt in her mind. He couldn't do that with Adam because Adam was told directly by God. So he leads her to sin. As St. Paul says, she sinned. And then she leads Adam to sin. People often ask me, 
Father, what was original sin? Was it an act of the body, an act of the soul? What? Well, Jesus tells Louisa it had nothing to do with an act of the body at all. It was an act of the will. The fruit was simply a representation of obeying the will of God. It could have been anything. It was a fruit. One of the many fruits of many of the trees in the garden, and they failed that one test. So Adam and Eve had fallen from God's preternatural gifts, which were infused knowledge, immortality, and immaculacy, meaning no concupiscence, no lust. What does infused knowledge mean? Adam had all the knowledge of all arts and sciences and music and chant. He knew the properties of all herbs and plants. He had the knowledge of the entire cosmos. And with one act of rebellion and sin, he lost it all. I say Adam and not Eve because it was the sin of Adam that infected the human race, principally, not Eve. Because the commandment was given to Adam, he was the head of the human race. Both Genesis recounts of creation confirm Adam was created first as the head. And he asked for a partner, not as an afterthought of God, no. God always knew that he was part of the original plan. They were meant to be two from the very beginning, even before Adam's creation. Because God is in communion with persons. He would never create a person to be alone. We are made in solidarity and saved in solidarity. So Adam was meant to have a spouse and a child to reflect the Trinity, the domestic church. Adam and Eve lost this prerogative of infused knowledge, whereby for the rest of the course of the centuries of mankind, we would have to, through much toil and labor, learn little by little just something of what he knew. And we're still not there. It's been about 6,000 years, according to Louisa's writing, since rational man exists. Jesus tells Louisa that God created the world in six epochs. Day is simply a symbol in scripture. It doesn't mean 24 hours. And science confirms that the earth has existed for millions and millions of years. So it's far predated rational man. But it took us thousands of years to get this far, and we're not even halfway there. Because of one sin. Why just one chance? because Adam had perfect clarity of thought and what we may call omniscience. Omniscience in the sense that he foresaw all the ends of his actions. He knew exactly the consequences of every act he would do, just as Lucifer did. That's why the angels had one chance. Despite their perfect clarity of view, of vision, they still sinned. And what makes it worse is that they had no temptation in them as we do. They did it freely. Adam had no lust in Eden. And what made it triply worse was that the person that tempted Adam was nothing but a vile serpent who offered him nothing in exchange. God was betrayed, who gave Adam everything he had around him, the entire cosmos. What did Lucifer give, Satan give him? And yet Adam bought Satan's sales pitch. Adam's infused knowledge, Eve's infused knowledge was lost. And that is why they could not recount in detail what it was like before original sin. And that is why today we know so little about what it was like before original sin. That is why we have confession. The Lord foreknew that we would fall again and again and again, venially or mortally, depending upon our state of soul. And that is why before leaving this earth, he gave us the sacrament of confession. Because we are all conceived with original sin and our intellects from the get-go are dimmed. And God sees that. And that's why he's merciful thousands and thousands of times with us. But the reason for his mercy is so that we turn back to him and repent and grow. Get back up and walk and turn to him. So Adam and Eve's sin disordered the entire cosmos. Not just the planet, the whole cosmos. Lucifer was given the entire material cosmos before Adam and Eve were made. And when he rebelled, the material order went into a state of decay and chaos. This may explain the violence of the dinosaurs in the past, or the ice ages and the volcanic eruptions and the meteors. All this disorder in the universe was not part of God's harmonious plan A. Somehow something went wrong, and it was the fall of the angels. 
But then God preserved one small planet immune from this disorder and within this planet was a garden called Eden. God made Adam outside of the garden and put him in the garden. Eve was made in the garden. They were immune from all the disorder of the material world brought on by the fall of the angels. Then God gave to Adam what Lucifer had, power over the material order. And what happened? Adam sinned. And what does Genesis relate? As soon as Adam sinned, thistles grew, beasts became wild. So here we have a cause-effect relationship between sin and natural disaster. The first natural disaster in our human history was original sin. So it is no wonder that the more sin abounds in the world, the more natural disasters increase. The more sin increases, the more nature will call us back to God. Why? Because nature was made in view of us. God made Adam and Eve after the five days of creation so that when Adam came to life with the breath of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit would move his memory to recall all that around him. The sun and the moon and the stars and the trees and the animals, all of which were submissive to his very nod. So when Adam and Eve sinned, nature turned against them because they turned against nature. Animals became wild. Thorns grew. And there was aging. Death. All the consequences of sin. They lost infused knowledge. They lost immortality. And they lost immaculacy. The Council of Trent states that even after we are baptized, there remains within us what's called concupiscence, the inclination to sin. So baptism does not do it all. It begins the work of sanctification. Certainly it takes away original sin definitively, and it reinstates us into the Christian family of Christ, whereby we become a new creature. But the battle has just begun. At baptism, what happens is that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are infused within us, personified, so to speak, through faith, hope, and love. And that admission of God's divine presence expels original sin. Original sin cannot leave by itself. It's crowded out, forced out by the admission of the three divine persons. So at the moment of baptism, the Holy Spirit dwells within us, who is inseparable from the Father and the Son, and where that makes us a new creature of God. And then the journey begins. So after original sin, Adam could not recount to Abel what it was like. He lost the infused knowledge to formulate the words, to convey the experience, because his intellect was now dimmed. Just recalling what it was like and acknowledging that he lost such a great gift brought him literally to tears. Jesus tells this to Louisa. That is why we know so little about how much God gave Adam and Eve before original sin. But now it's revealed to us in the writings of Luisa Picaretta, the first 19 volumes of which have received the churches in Pramater and Nihil Upstadt, and all of which, all 40 works, 36 volumes plus four works she wrote in addition to the volumes, have been condensed and translated into English and sealed by the church in this doctoral dissertation. Luisa wrote more than 5,000 pages. Very few people will be able to read everything she wrote. It was intended principally for the hierarchy to systematically and theologically review, to compare it with the tradition and magisterial teachings of the church, and to condense all of these thousands of pages of writings and break them down into simple terms, into short books for the laity. That's beginning now. All of Luisa's works has been translated into English. All 5,000 plus pages are condensed here into 400 pages. And this work was submitted to the congregations for the doctrine of faith in Rome and the causes of saints in Rome and to the archdiocese of a cause for beatification so that the work may now begin. Quando io, eh, la conobbi la prima volta, io dissi, Luisa, io voglio, mi voglio far suora. Ti vuoi fare suora? La tua volontà sotto i piedi. Voleva inculcarmi l'obbedienza, 
la sottomissione ai superiori. Se tu devi essere una sposa di Cristo, devi avere queste caratteristiche, altrimenti che sposa sei? Prima di, di, di entrare in comunità ho voluto salutare Luisa e affidarmi alle sue preghiere. È stata lei che forse ha dato forza alla mia vocazione. Luisa was a very simple, unlettered Italian girl who at a very tender age began experiencing terrible nightmares and woke up in cold sweats due to the devil's harassing. She would often take refuge in the fold of her mother's arms and by virtue of the little education her parents gave her, namely instructions on the Our Father and Hail Mary, she would seek refuge by praying the Hail Mary. This is the beginning of Louisa's devotion to the Blessed Mother, whom she would often invoke as La Mamma Celeste, the Heavenly Mother. God allows Satan sometimes in our lives to tempt us, so that by turning to prayer, ultimately Satan drives us to God. These dreams continued till she was about 11 years old. What happened was she had taken the name of Magdalene at the parish to join a society of women. And from the moment she took that name Magdalene, she ceased to experience these terrible sweats. And she started to experience first locutions. And these locutions were followed by visions and then apparitions. She was born on April 23rd, 1865 exactly 130 years after Louisa's birth, Pope John Paul II made that birthday the Feast of Divine Mercy. On April 23, 1874, at the age of nine, Louisa received her first communion from her pastor, Father Furio, and that's when she began to hear the voice of Jesus at the age of nine. These are called locutions, interior voices, and they assume three different forms, so to speak. John of the Cross lists three, successive, formal, and substantial. He says we can receive the former two, successive and formal, if we're disposed and recollected and away from noise and destruction. God speaks to our conscience in silence. The third type is a supernatural gift, namely substantial locutions, that will impose themselves upon you even if you're in the middle of a conversation. These are rare. Louisa had these mystical, extraordinary gifts. In 1878, Louisa receives her first vision of Jesus carrying the cross. It was at the age of 13. When she had this vision of Jesus, she beheld him carrying the cross, surrounded by a host of centurion soldiers and throngs of crowds jeering at him, mocking him, spitting at him, beating him. And he looked up at her and he said to her, Anima, ayuta me. Soul, help me. She was so taken by this vision that she collapsed unconscious. That began in her life, the beginning of her state of victimhood. Victimhood is a term used in mystical theology to describe the mystic's assimilation with the Lord's passion for the purpose of saving, redeeming, sanctifying souls. And Our Lady Fatima showed three shepherd children, Lucia, Francisco, and Jacinta, a vision of hell. And they screamed. And Our Lady said, there are many souls that are going to hell because there are not enough people to pray for them. So we can save souls through our prayers and sacrifices. Well, that was the purpose of Louisa's victimhood. She was chosen by God to make sacrifice, to take upon herself Jesus' sacrifice to save souls. That's called the state of victimhood. At the age of 16 in 1881, she accepts the state of victimhood and is intermittently confined to bed. In 1882, at the age of 17, 
Louisa composes the Christmas novena that she would recite for the rest of her life, nine days before Christmas. On October 16, 1888, one year later, she experiences her first nuptial of spiritual marriage on earth, the age of 23. September 7, 1889, Louisa experiences her second nuptial of spiritual marriage, not on earth, but in heaven in which Jesus takes possession of her heart. Several days later, the Trinity confirms Louisa and establishes in her heart its divine indwelling. This is when God gives her the gift of living in the divine will. No saint has ever experienced spiritual marriage in heaven. In an undated entry, after September 7, 1889, and before February of 1899, Louisa experiences her third nuptial, the spiritual marriage of the cross, where she begins to suffer with Jesus almost continuously for the salvation of souls to avoid chastisements on earth as she foresaw in mystical vision to condition the outcome of the second and first world wars which she went experienced the cholera epidemic which she experienced to mitigate the effects of these atrocities then on February 28, 1899 in obedience to her confessor she begins to write So she had to write what she experienced extemporaneously. That's why she left out dates. She didn't remember them. November 16th, 1900, at the age of 35, Louisa experiences her fourth and final nuptial in which she possesses Jesus' heart, receives three divine breaths, and embarks on becoming centered in the divine will and on possessing the divine will entirely and completely. So far, Louisa has experienced four nuptials, which suggests a progression toward the center of the divine will that she enters into on November 16, 1900. Now she enters the center. So Jesus exhorts her from this day forth, don't leave the center of my will. In the second nuptial in heaven, Jesus took possession of Louisa's heart. In this fourth nuptial, Louisa takes possession of Jesus' heart. Jesus would later tell Louisa, in baptism, you become the temple of the Holy Spirit. When you become centered in me, God becomes your temple. The Trinity becomes your temple. On November 12, 1925, Pope Pius XI institutes the Feast of Christ the King. It's very ominous and prophetic because this is about the time the divine will is established on earth in Louisa and in other saints like Faustina, Padre Pio, Mother Teresa of Calcutta, Blessedina Belanger, Venerable Concepcion de Aramida, Maximilian Kolbe, Servant of God Martha Robin, Sopochko, Saint Hannibal de Francia, who would eventually become a saint, who was Louisa's confessor and censor, and others. On October 7, 7, 1928, at the request of Hannibal, who founded two orders, the Rogationist Fathers and the Sisters of Divine Zeal, Louisa enters into the Sisters of Divine Zeal convent, and she would live there exactly 10 years to the day, and she would call it the House of the Divine Will. And there's a tabernacle today placed in exactly the place where Louisa's bed was. That's now a chapel. On August 31st, 1938, exactly 10 years later to the day, Louisa's three works are placed on the index of prohibited books next to those of Faustina Kowalska and Antonio Rosmini, all three of whom were rehabilitated by the church. So Faustina's works were rehabilitated by Karol Wojtyla, Rosmini's works were rehabilitated by him, and Louisa's works were rehabilitated by Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger. Only two times in the history of the church have there ever been a, two cardinals that have rehabilitated the writings of a mystic and then were made popes. Karol Wojtyla rehabilitated the writings of his compatriot Faustina and made it a universal feast day in the church and made an indult, gave an indult to the church stating that all liturgical books, meaning the sacramentary the priest reads from on the altar, the lectionary that the lay person reads from, and the breviary, must adhere to this feast of divine mercy the first Sunday after Easter and yet very few priests celebrate the feast of divine mercy it's an indult the Pope issued and it says all liturgical books must adhere to this feast part of the reason for this negligence is the 
lack of importance given to these private revelations. Cardinal Ratzinger was the second cardinal who would become pope to rehabilitate the writings of a mystic, namely Louisa. So all you have to do in life is rehabilitate the writings of a mystic, then you'll become a pontiff. <laughs> That's all it takes. <laughs> it's a short cap shortcut to the papacy. <laughs> Louisa was called the little, little daughter of the divine will. That was her title, given to her by Jesus. And Mary is the mother of the divine will. Louisa said to Jesus, when am I going to be the big daughter? He said, you will always be the little daughter. <laughs> because Mary is the big daughter. And also the mother of the church. So we can say that Pope John Paul II was the Pope of the divine mercy. And Pope Ratzinger, the Pope of the divine will. And the divine will, mercy and the divine will work hand in hand. So after her writings were placed on the index on October 7, 1938, just over one month later, she left this convent of the Sisters of Divine Zeal and was relocated on the same street that her new confessor, Reverend Benedicto Calvi, lived. He was the chaplain to the Sisters of Divine Zeal. So he knew the sisters and he knew Louisa and he became Louisa's confessor for the second time. So Benedict Calvi came back to her and was assigned as her confessor by her bishop. So he called her to the street in which she lived so that he would be more in proximity to her on Via Madalena, the same name she took when she joined the society at the church. On December 28, 1938, Louisa writes her last volume, the 36th volume. She wrote 36 volumes. And she wrote four more works. The Hours of the Passion of Our Lord Jesus Christ, The Virgin Mary in the Kingdom of the Divine Will, The Pious Pilgrimage of a Soul in the Divine Will, which are known as the Rounds, and the Christmas Novena, a little booklet. She wrote many letters of correspondence. This is an interesting to note that neither she nor Hannibal even knew, but Jesus knew. And I had stumbled across during my studies Ten years of studies on this thesis. Her volumes are grouped in the sacred number of 12. 12, 12, and 12. 12 tribes of Israel, 12 apostles, 12 stars of Mary around Mary's head. The first group of 12 talk about the fiat of redemption because Louisa was born during the time of the redemption. She was conceived before the gift of the divine will in the fiat of redemption. The second group of 12 are all about the fiat of creation. And the third group about the fiat of sanctification. So they're grouped in 12. Three groups, 12 volumes, divine numbers. It gets better. These are the volumes given by Jesus. Mary gave Louisa lessons for the month of May, right? That book is entitled the Virgin Mary in the Kingdom of the Divine Will. How many lessons are there? 36. There were 31 and Hannibal, not being aware of it, told her, you know what, you didn't address the presentation, you didn't address five of the mysteries, can you do that? So 31 lessons became 36. Coincidence? We can say that the volumes are the male version of teaching us how to live in the Divine Will, namely from Jesus, and the Virgin Mary in the Kingdom of the Divine Will book is the female version, the mother's version of training us how to live in the Kingdom of the Divine Will. All 36 lessons each. Jesus spoke at great length and in varied ways because Louisa had virtually no education and Mary picked up on that. She let the Lord do all the teaching. She gave us meditations for each day. Now this is important to note. I mentioned this briefly earlier. Very few will be able to read everything Louisa wrote. If you read everything, including the letters and these other works, they come out to more than 6,000 pages. What I've done in this work is condensed everything she wrote. What that means is she, being repetitive, uncoordinated and scattered in her writings, she wasn't a theologian. She just wrote as she recalled things. So what I did was I removed the repetition and put things down that she said without repeating them and it was con all this is condensed into 400 pages but not only that it's presented in chronological sequence beginning with creation redemption sanctification and not just that 
the graces, 33 new graces she received are presented in the manner in which she received them, the order in which she received them. On March 4, 1947, the only diagnosable illness in her life, she breathes her last on this earth. Do you know that Louisa asked Jesus how to die? She said, Jesus, could I request how the manner by which I might, might die? He said, go ahead and speak. She said, I would like to die of pneumonia. And he answered her prayers. On November 20th, 1994, her cause for beatification opened and she received the title Servant of God. And October 29th, 2005, the cause of beatification concluded its diocesan procedure called ITER. November 2012, the first doctoral dissertation was defended and approved and received the seals of the Vatican University under the Holy See, which I just shared with you, and it was published just about a month ago. The book is entitled The Gift of Living in the Divine Will in the Writings of Luisa Picaretta. Let's talk a little bit about creation, namely what Adam and Eve were doing in Eden. What do you think they were doing in Eden? Before you answer, consider that in heaven, in Eden, before sin, the focus was not on doing, it was on being. They were united with God in ecstasy. So there was no time, really. They didn't count the minutes or the seconds, you know. There was a progression, a growth, an advance in holiness, just as there is in heaven. Heaven's an ongoing growth of holiness. It's not static. It's not irreformable. Heaven is a constant growth and dynamism in God, in the Trinity of Persons. And Louisa describes this in detail, how the angels and the blessed in heaven bathe in God's light. And the more they bathe in that divine light, the more they grow in his knowledge and in his presence, in his being, and they partake of that being. Of course, they have things to do. They intercede. They have missions. They're sent for. They protect. They defend. They enlighten. That's all part and parcel of their Internet interconnectivity between the material and spiritual orders. In creation, what Adam was doing primarily was glorifying God on behalf of all creation, in and through creation. Third chapter of Daniel, chapter 57 and following, you will come across a prayer by which Daniel, the author ostensibly, goes throughout the cosmos, glorifying God on behalf of each created thing, right? Also, the psalm, ostensibly penned by David, number 148, does the same. Louisa used this approach, not because she knew the scriptures like we do, or theologians do, but because God, Jesus in particular, taught it to her. But it was different in a way, and I'm going to ask you to see if you know what the divine will is about. This is the litmus test. Daniel went throughout the cosmos glorifying God spiritually. He wasn't going physically, right? Same with David in the psalm. Francis of Assisi, brother, son, sister, moon. He would glorify God in and through creation. Okay, let's fast forward to Louisa. I'll jump back to creation. Just a quick question. How was Louisa's rounds in creation different than those of Daniel, the psalmist, and Francis? Louisa would go throughout creation, similar to the pattern followed in scripture, glorifying, adoring, praising, and thanking God in and through all creation. Theologically, this is the difference concerning time and space. I'll give you three words, adjectives, finite, infinite, and eternal. What's the difference? Finite has a beginning and an end. Finite creatures are like plants. Infinite has a beginning and no end. That's what we are, infinite beings. We're, we're, we will never be obliterated. We will go either to heaven or hell in the end. Eternal has neither beginning nor end. Only God is eternal. All creatures, angels, Mary, us, we're infinite. Consider that. God is eternal. We are infinite. Irrational beings are finite. Now, when Daniel prayed and some the psalmist prayed, Francis prayed, their prayers were impacting creatures, beings, and other elements that they were worshiping God in and through during their lifetime. 
when we pray in the divine will, where God, as you mentioned, is doing it in us, Jesus, who is eternal. God is both divine and human. He forged two natures together through what we call in theology a hypostatic union, meaning that the finite acts we do that have a beginning and an end, like picking up a book and putting it down, that's one act. That's finite. It ends right there. When Christ took on our human nature, each act he did became eternal. It was fused and and braided, grafted with his eternal nature, making it divine. He imparted to a finite act an infinite quality. That's what went on with the redemption. That's why he redeemed all souls of the past, present, future because he alone is eternal. He can go into the past and into the future. Now, let's apply this to Louise's rounds. When she was doing her rounds in the divine will, they were following the same external pattern as Daniel and Psalmist and Francis, but once the divine will comes into her, the Trinity is doing it, therefore her prayers are impacting not just all creatures of her time, but of the past, present, and future. That's the difference of living in the divine will as opposed to the saints of the past who pray in perfect conformity with God's will. They were only able to impact human beings and creatures in their lifetime. Jesus says that to Louisa. He said, if my divine will was not the motive force behind my human actions, my redemption would have been limited to a few generations. Why a few generations and not one? Because his lifetime spanned about three. Right now you're living in the, within the lifespan of grandparents and children. That's about three generations. And Christ's life would have been just limited to that if the divine will was not within him. God used and continues to use the woman to defeat the, the enemy, the devil. In fact, after Adam and Eve had fallen, God gave what's called the first proto-evangelium, the first proclamation of salvation. He said that he would eventually send a redeemer by saying, in the end, you will strike at her heel and she will crush her head. Foretelling the future redeemer that would be born of Mary who would defeat sin and Satan by his resurrection. Now in the book of Revelation chapter 12 we find her again in the first book and in the last book. A woman with the sun, clothed with the sun with the moon under her feet and on her head a crown of 12 stars. 12, 12, 12. So Mary, the woman, will defeat the enemy and Satan will be enchained by the woman's prayer, the rosary that she gave us. The rosary and by our acts in the divine will that help vanquish evil from our midst. Back to Adam and Eve in creation. Their primary role was to make their rounds in creation, glorifying God in and through all creations. But in such a way they were impacting everything at the same time, past, present, and future. What he was doing was he was disposing each and every human being that was said to be born for the gift that he received freely the gift of living in the divine will. Adam was the head of the human race, not Eve. That does not mean he was superior to her. It's a question of roles. We have different functions in the mystical body of Christ. But what it is is that role of head of the human race bears with it a great responsibility. So in Adam's role, he was going throughout the cosmos that he had perfect vision of. He had this all-embracing vision of all things. I already explained that he had knowledge of everything by infusion. And he was thanking God for everything that God made in view of him in the preceding five days of his creation. Requiting God so as to redouble the love in creation. See, God put a certain amount of love in all creation, in the sun, in the moon, in the blades of grass, in the stars, and that love is expressed through the color, through the heat, through the warmth, through the light, through the various effects of these creatures. But those effects are redoubled by Adam's requital of love to God. So now there's an intensification of, of perfume, but not in the sense that it bothers your nose, but in the sense that it's even greater, an intensification of light. Not that it blinds you, but that the quality, not the quantity, is intensified. An intensification of love, an intensification of harmony, an intensification of beauty and holiness. All everything was intensified, redoubled and tripled. God tells this to Louisa. And when Adam 
was doing these rounds, he was giving each and every one of you here the gift of living in the divine will, the grace for you to receive it by conception. But Adam couldn't do it in one act. He had to go throughout the cosmos several times. Only God knew this number of how many acts he would do before the time was ripe for the earth to be filled and Jesus to come down to become a triumphant king escorted by his angels with a scepter in his hand and become the head of the human race, the king of creation with Adam, who was his prince, Christ was the king, and would reign on earth for eternity with all of us. But because Adam sinned, that plan was suspended. Not ended, suspended. And all these acts that Adam was supposed to do throughout the creation, through his rounds, were suspended as well, waiting to be seized when the time was ripe by God's gift. He tells Louisa that when he actualized this gift with her for the first time in human history, these suspended acts were now available to be taken, seized, so to speak, in a good way by us so that we can continue the work of Adam and redo what Adam failed to do, which is establishing within himself a kingdom, a cosmos within his soul. Each and every one of us are called to do exactly what Adam was supposed to do. That was Adam's role. Now Eve comes onto the scene as his lovely and beautiful partner, always obedient, always submissive, always at doing whatever he asks without ever complaining. But Eve was a perfect icon of Adam and they were perfect, it was a match made in heaven. Adam was to go throughout the cosmos and deposit within himself all acts. This is something we haven't heard of before because now being revealed to us is what was going on in Eden, what was never revealed before because Adam couldn't express it. He lost the infused knowledge. But Jesus is giving this to us through Louisa. So now we know what Adam's role was. As the head, he was to incorporate within himself by assimilating with his actions all the actions of all human beings that had yet to come to light. So while he was walking, he was calling to mind the steps of everyone. Remember, he had an all-embracing vision of everyone. As he was praying, he was calling to his prayers the prayers of everyone. And he was depositing, that's the word Louise uses, within his soul, expanding his soul to contain every act of every creature, rational or irrational, that would ever be created. Once he would have completed that, he would have com established the kingdom, right? But he interrupted that with original sin, and the kingdom was never established. Louisa was the first creature to establish that after Mary, but the first creature conceived in sin. So Mary's, Eve's role before sin was to receive from Adam all these acts that he deposited within himself from him and transmit them to her progeny. Adam was supposed to give them to his children through Eve. She was the conduit. Much like Mary is the mediatrix of all grace. She receives the grace of Jesus and gives it to us. That was the plan. That's plan B. Plan A was Adam and Eve. So Adam was but to deposit and Eve was to transmit. Much like the man gives the seed, the woman nourishes the seed and brings forth the seed.
would like to open up the floor to our questions concerning Louise's life. Hello, my name is Tony. You mentioned the indwelling of the Blessed Trinity uh, in our as a, like a gift to Louisa. But that also brought to mind uh, the passage, I am in you and you are in me, and the Father dwells in me, and we will dwell in you. So wasn't that the precursor also of, of this indwelling? He didn't mention the Spirit though. He says the Father will come. But it doesn't mean that the Spirit is absent. To understand the different schools of theology concerning the indwelling that takes place, we should first consider the patristics. They are the first theologians of the Catholic Church. Patristics means fathers, the early church fathers like Saints Augustine, Cyril of Jerusalem, etc. Then you have the medieval theologians known as scholastics. Thomas Aquinas, Bonaventure, Bernard of Clairvaux. They don't always agree with each other. So when I had to compare Louise's text to the writings of the Church Fathers and the writings of the Scholastics and the writings of those that follow the Scholastics known as Resourcement Theologians, I had to present them in such a way that Louise's text found its support in one of these three sources of theology. With the indwelling of the Trinity, the patristics reflect more than the scholastics the trinitarian indwelling thomas was of the scholastic opinion that only the holy spirit dwells with us at baptism it doesn't mention the father it doesn't mention the son which is true because if you consider the mission of divine appropriation the father creates the son redeems and the spirit sanctifies and baptism is sanctification so it is true that the holy spirit dwells within us at baptism However, with this newly actualized gift of living in the divine will, in baptism, the Holy Spirit dwells within us, but he's inseparable from the other two persons, correct? Who is incarnate in the Eucharist? The Father, the Son, or the Spirit? What about the Father and the Spirit, if they're inseparable? You see my point? Just because we say the Spirit indwells, it doesn't mean the Father and the Son aren't there. The question doesn't come down to presence, but operation. Father and the Son are there with the Spirit because they're inseparable, but the Spirit is operating in us at baptism. The Father and the Son concur in that work, but the Spirit is the agent. After we're baptized, we receive the operation of the Holy Spirit. Now the Father and the Son become fully actualized as well, and they operate no less vehemently than the Holy Spirit, which cannot be said about baptism. God is more present in a baptized infant than he is in a blade of grass. God is more baptized in a mystic than he is in a baptized infant. God is more present in the Eucharist than he is in any other human being. That is his body, blood, soul, and divinity, and that contains a divine person. Whereas when we receive him, we remain a human person. Now, when we receive him in the divine will, certainly there's a double operation going on there, which gives God greater glory. But to summarize it, Mary had this indwelling of the Trinity from her immaculate conception. The wisdom of the Son, the power of the Father, and the love of the Spirit were literally possessing her intellect, memory, and will, breath, heartbeat, and lifeblood. They were the motive force, approximately, not remotely. They were the ones doing the acts in Mary. She wasn't doing it. She was cooperating with the Trinity, Trinity's acts. When I say their acts, God is one operation, but that one operation absorbs our finite acts and in Mary it absorbed it in such a way that God was the one doing the acts and Mary was simply cooperating with the Father's act through her will, the Son's act through her every thought, the intellect, the Spirit's act through her every recalling anything through her memory. Whereas in the baptized that is not the case. Saint Charles Bellarmine, another scholastic thinker, said and the Catholic Catechism buttresses this. In baptism, we do, God does not perform the act when we do our actions. We do. God disposes us, but we do the actions. And Bellarmine goes so far as to say that God assists us remotely through grace, but we do the act. With the gift of living in the divine will, all three divine persons do the act in us, and all we do is cooperate. Blessed Mother is the spouse of the Holy Spirit. I'd like to know 
more on that. I, what does that mean? Thank you. So would I. <laughs> well, <laughs> Louise addresses this issue, not directly, but indirectly, as follows. She talks about the Holy Spirit overshadowing Mary and giving her what we would call in biology the seed to form the life of the, the humanity, not the life, the humanity of the Son of God who existed from eternity. So she gave to him a human nature. So really the body and blood of Christ comes from Mary. It's Mary's body and blood in the Eucharist too. And uh, in that sense, the spirit is her spouse at the moment of the incarnation because no man had relations with her. And that espousalship is part and parcel of the way in which we receive the gift of living in the divine will. Unlike Mary who physically bore Jesus in her womb, we bear him mystically within our souls. When I say we bear him mystically, I'm not saying it's the mystical life, because Jesus makes it clear to Louisa that the mystical life that the church teaches us are the stages of purgation, illumination, unification, or the seven interior mansions, both of which, the mansions and the stages, culminate with spiritual marriage. He tells Louisa, this is greater than spiritual marriage. It doesn't mean we are greater than mystics. That's very important for me to accentuate. The gift is greater, not us. It's like the Eucharist. John the Baptist, Jesus said, no man born of woman would be greater than. And yet, even the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. But he didn't have the Eucharist, which is the greatest, at the time, the greatest sacrament and gift God could have given the human family. So how could John be greater than the apostles or St. Joseph who had the Eucharist? See what I'm saying? Just because the Eucharist is the greater gift, it doesn't necessarily mean we're greater. Same with the gift of living in the divine will. The ability we have with this gift to impact all centuries with every act we do, the saints in the past did not have, due to no defect of their own. They were perfectly disposed to receive this gift. But God did not choose to actualize it in their lifetime. He reserved it for our times. Just as he waited thousands of years before the Incarnation, he's waited thousands of years before actualizing this gift. So just as Mary received in bridalship, so to speak, the Holy Spirit in order to conceive the Son of God, we need to receive the Holy Spirit as well, the fiat of sanctification, which is attributed to the Holy Spirit in order to conceive the gift of living in the divine will, which engenders within us the full our powers of the soul, the full operation of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit within us. So that's how she's considered the spouse of the Holy Spirit, but it doesn't mean that she has a monopoly over the Spirit and we can't be its spouse, no. We can all be considered in this sense, brides, bridegrooms of the Holy Spirit. Good afternoon, Father Anderson. I'm Diana. Uh, quite a few of us here also do the cynical. And uh, I read a testimony that you made after the death of Father Gobi that, in fact, the inner locutions that Father Gobi had been receiving from the Blessed Mother and that are contained in the Blue Book uh, are authentic. Uh, this was very well received by all of us because uh, it's always good to have someone verify it. Uh, I wanted to ask you uh, in, in the Blue Book messages, Father Gobby speaks about the second Pentecost. He speaks about the uh, second coming of Jesus, which will coincide with the second Pentecost, and also that this will usher in the Eucharist, Eucharistic reign of uh, Jesus on the earth. And I would have to imagine that when that time comes, it would be then the, the fulfillment and therefore the divine will could be totally uh, completed because we would all be living on this earth in the divine will. Everyone will be doing the will of God. So wouldn't that be the completion 
of the divine will that Luisa Picaretta is speaking about? I believe that the Eucharistic reign of Jesus, the triumph of the Immaculate Heart, the error of peace, the second Pentecost, the, the fulfillment of the Our Father prayer on earth as it is in heaven, are all synonymous. There is a series of how it occurs, but it's all one event with different moments in that one great event. So let's say Mary right now is bringing about the triumph by gathering up her white army, as Father Gobi calls it, gathering up her elect, and the angels are being sent out to mark them. So that when, as he speaks of a calamity coming, these people will find their refuge in her immaculate heart. Father Gobi reveals that there are no safe havens you have to go running to. Certainly the Lord will inspire people to prepare things, and that is what they're supposed to do. But we have to discern for ourselves what places we are what means we have at our disposals, what places we should prepare if we are to do that. But what is more important than a physical haven is the spiritual because if we are united and consecrated to the Immaculate and Sacred Hearts on today's Feast of the Solemnity of the Sacred Heart, then they will take care of us. When the time is ripe, they will move us, they will lead us, they will inspire people to dispose the events in such a way that we will be taken care of. But I believe Mary is now already preparing the triumph of the Immaculate Heart by forming this white army, remnant, so to speak, that will, with her, crush the head of Satan with her heel. And in so doing, she's already starting individually within us this Eucharistic reign. And I'll explain to you what that is now. The Eucharistic reign is first and foremost an interior reality whereby we become living hosts. When we receive the gift of living in the divine will, whom God the, and Father Gobi spoke about, Luisa Picaretta, as an authentic mystic, what we're talking about is the Trinity indwelling in us in such a way that it, there is established in our souls a new presence that has never been experienced in the baptized since the fall, apart from Mary. Well, she, we can't say she was baptized sacramentally, or Jesus, you know, he was baptized in the water, not sacramentally since the fall and that is called in quotes and in capital letters his real life it's similar to the real presence that comes from Trent that describes the second person of the Trinity's presence in the Eucharist when the Council of Trent wanted to give a name for the Eucharist how Jesus abides in the Eucharist body blood soul and divinity they came up with the term real presence Real life is similar. Jesus uses that word with Louisa. He says that when you live in the divine will, I'm, I have several thoughts in my head, I don't want to get ahead of myself. When you live in the divine will, the Father possesses the will, the, will, the, the Son, the intellect, the spirit, the memory. So the soul now is inhabited by the three divine persons that begin to now operate through these three principal faculties of the soul. As long as you live in the state of grace and as long as you have a firm desire and upright intention to do the will of God always and invite his one eternal operation that transcends time and space, there is established within you this real life. This real life is the same exact presence as the real presence in the Eucharist. So it, when you receive communion, Jesus is literally present in you, body, blood, soul, and divinity, right? Suppose you could perpetuate that Eucharist in you 24-7. That is what the real life is. And that is principally what's meant by the Eucharistic reign of Jesus in us. Now, after the purification of the earth, when people that remain, which will be only good, about one-third, Zephaniah says, two-thirds will be annihilated, according to Zephaniah, and it has not yet happened since he wrote that Old Testament book, then the good that remain, they will adore the Eucharist also throughout the earth. So there's both an interior and exterior dimension to the Eucharistic reign. So every knee will bend, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Second Pentecost. It is my conviction from theological studies of the mystics for decades that there runs throughout scriptures a law called biblical parallels. What happened in the past repeats itself, both good and bad, but in greater intensity. 
So just as there was the darkness in Exodus, there will be the darkness again in the future. Just as the sun turned to blood in Exodus, the sun will turn to blood again in the future. And we see this in the Gen Exodus and we see it in the book of Revelation. Similarly, with Christ's 40-day sojourn between the resurrection and the ascension, that will happen again. Just as Christ, not that he will resurrect again, what I'm saying is those appearances of Christ and those that came to life to witness on his behalf will be occurring during the reign, Eucharistic reign. This is the second Pentecost in my opinion. That we will have visitations of saints, especially those that were beheaded during the persecution. They will come back to life, Revelation 19 says, and the second death will have no power over them. What does that mean? It could very well mean, in keeping with the concept of biblical parallels, that just as Christ appeared and disappeared, and those that had risen from their tombs to testify to his resurrection appeared and disappeared, that will occur during the period of Eucharistic reign of Jesus, during the triumph of the Immaculate Heart, during the era of peace, whereby they will also instruct us. They will exhort us and encourage us. And this will be an exfusion of gifts of the Holy Spirit teaching us, training us, and that will be part of the outpouring as well. We will still be conceived in sin. We will still need all the sacraments. This isn't your utopia, sinless society, no. But sin will be modified because the Satan will be enchained, according to scripture, for a thousand years. That's a biblical term that doesn't, is not to be taken literally. It's a long period of time. We don't know how long, but it will be very long. Pope John Paul II spoke of a millennium of Christianity, of unifications, and a springtime of Christianity in the future. The millennium is the thousand years of peace, right? Good afternoon, Father. I'm Josephine. What should we answer when they ask us about the fallen angels? Find it in Daniel, the Old Testament book of Daniel. And we find it in the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus, in the book of Daniel, speaks of the angels. In the book of Matthew, it speaks of Satan. Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from the sky. And so Hebrews, that's right, Hebrews. And Peter, Second Peter. He says, when the angels fell, they inhabited dark places. And he gives it this uh, Aramaic term. And why? The reason why the angels didn't want to obey God to um, worship God. A man. That's theologians of the early church, including some church fathers, as I noted earlier. This is not an official teaching of the church. Yeah. It's the teaching of early church fathers. Now, there is a graduation of, let's say, authenticity when it comes to revelation. There are primary sources, secondary sources, tertiary sources, and so forth. When you do a doctoral dissertation, you have to separate in the bibliography the primary sources. Let's say those people that wrote from those people that commented on their writings, secondary sources, and so forth. Same thing with Revelation. Since the Church Father's writings are considered when spoken in unanimity, no less inspired than sacred scripture, we should listen to them more attentively than other writers, like ecclesiastical writers that came after them, like Tertullian and Origen, or ecclesiastical writers, not Church Fathers. Because the councils, the early ecumenical councils too, stated that the early Church Father's writings when in agreement, are no less inspired than sacred scripture itself. And some of them purport that theory. Um, Father, in the uh, blue book, uh, if this remnant army of Mary means little, right, Father, does it also follow that people who will be living in the divine will will also be little or remnant? Absolutely. Louisa was called the little daughter of the divine will. And we all will be little daughters and sons in the divine will absolutely Jesus remember with the episode of the apostles the sons of thunder James and John you know why they call James and John sons of thunder right because when Jesus went to Samaria he went to preach in that area of Samaria the upper parts of Israel they didn't accept him why because he had a Galilean accent he was from the wrong side of the tracks and they didn't want to accept his message they rejected him so James and John said, Lord, call thunder to come down from heaven and consume them. And he sharply said, you don't know what you're saying. So Jesus labeled them sons of thunder. <laughs> so anyway, um, these sons of thunder, James and John, were vying for a place besides Jesus' right and left. 
So they asked him in private, Jesus, can you do something for us? When you're in your kingdom, we won't put one at the right, one at the left. And the other apostles listened in and said, oh, they beat us to it. <laughs> now they were hoping that Jesus would turn them down. And he did. He said, you don't know, it's, you don't know what you, you were asking. Will you drink from the same chalice as me? Yes, you will, but to give you the places at my right and left is not for me to give. Those places have been assigned. You know? So, then he pulled a little child in their midst and said, if you want to be the first of all, you must be the servant of all, like a little child. So we have to be little in order to live in the divine will. And even if it's, if it's a little army, you know, it doesn't matter. Uh, Luisa Picaretta's um, teachings that um, Christ would be king and Adam would be the prince. So my question is, does she have the same view as the Franciscans that, like Don Scotus, Mary of Agreda, that Christ would come yes. even without sin? Yes, she does. Okay. Also Ratzinger, he Ratzinger. And, and Ambrose. They believe that as well. Okay. He, yes, Jesus tells Louisa that even if Adam and Eve had not sinned, he would have come down. Not a redeemer to shed his blood because the shedding of blood is a result of sin. If there had been no sin, he would have come down escorted by hosts of angels with scepter in his hand to become the king, the head of the human race and confirm the human race in this beatific state. I would add to that, this doesn't come from Louisa, just from my personal study, that the idea of marriage and celibacy plays into this as well. In the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve were told to be fruitful and multiply, to fill the earth and be its steward before original sin. So they were to procreate. No question about it. They had Cain and Abel. We don't know if it was after or before, but they were supposed to procreate before. Now, once the earth was filled, let's say, and the time was ripe and they didn't sin, what would have happened to marriage? In my opinion, based on Matthew's Gospel, I think it's chapter 23, when the apostles ask him, referring to yesterday's book of Tobit, this woman married seven times and seven men died. Who will be her husband in the next life? Referring to Sarah. And he said in the next life there is no giving over to marriage. They become like angels. It doesn't mean that the marital bond is ruptured. It just means that there's no ceremony of marriage in heaven, but the bonds remain on earth in heaven. Okay. To justify that there is no ceremonial marriage in heaven and yet to say that it was on earth, what would have happened to this transition period if there had been no sin? My opinion is this, that once the earth was populated and filled and Adam and Eve had passed the test, Christ would have come down and sublimated their bodies to the state of perpetual celibacy. Because they had one purpose, to fill the earth, and they did it, and now they obey the next purpose. That's why I think religious, when they make a vow of celibacy, are anticipating the next life. Already now, that which we will all embrace in the next life if we make it to heaven. Right? So spiritual, so fecundity, generation, in the Old Testament was just according to the flesh. If a woman was barren, she was considered blessed, uh, cursed, an outcast. So Elizabeth was praying for a child. Abraham's wife, Sarah, was praying for a child. A woman with an issue of blood touched the hem of Jesus' garment to be cured to have a child. So every woman would lay hold of two men just to have a child. Then when Christ came, He's born of a virgin. He made celibacy a virtue. Okay? So now importance is not generation according to the flesh anymore. The primacy of importance is on generation according to the spirit, generating souls to eternal life. Good afternoon, Father. My name is David. Uh, I just wanted to ask you, Father, um, I watched the Catholicism series of Father Barron, and he gave a... Uh, what they call this uh, emphasis, uh, emphasis there on the Blessed Trinity on Saint Augustine and he said that the Father is the mind and then self-knowledge is the Son and then self-love is the Holy Spirit so I was just wondering if it had any uh, connection with that of uh, Picaretta so. it does I did a chapter on Augustine in my dissertation he does use a triad with regard to the properties of the soul as well 
He, that's why I said the patristic thinkers accept the triune indwelling. Augustine's a patristic thinker. The scholastics don't. So yes, he sees that personification of the three divine persons as well in the intellect, memory, and will, the uh, mind. Good afternoon, so. Father. Uh, I'm Cynthia. Uh, I'd like to ask what is the stand of the ch our church with regards to these mystic revelations, Father? What is? All right. The present status of Louisa's causes, her beatification is still underway. As you know, the process involves opening up the cause, which occurred in 1994 at the release of her writings at the hands of Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger. Then, a positio, meaning the position of the diocese, was submitted to the Vatican, 2005, and um, that contains all of the written and ocular and irregular testimonial reports pertaining to the herosity of her virtues. So she lived a very virtuous life and everything she wrote. So you have the testimonials and the writings put in a box sealed with a wax seal and sent from the diocese where she was born to the Vatican. And the Vatican begins to review that. Now, to backtrack one second, when the cause began in 1994, automatically she received the title Servant of God. Whenever a cause opens, they are given that title. Once all the writings are approved and the critical edition is ready and all that, then she may be declared venerable if the church wants. Or they can skip that title venerable and just make her blessed on two approved miracles. One approved miracle. Two for canonization. The church can also forego those two miracles, but in today's world they seldom do. Back in the day they didn't have any of these protocol procedures. St. Anthony was canonized in three years by popular acclaim. He was the quickest ordained canonized saint, St. Anthony because he was Italian. <laughs> no, but it was because St. Francesco, St. Francis, yeah. But today it takes, a, you know, the, on average it takes a person from the time the cause opens for beatification till they're beatified on average 15 years. Do you know how many miracles are a, reported to Rome every month for a for um, a cause of a saint? 40. 40 miracles a month. Now, our God is a God of miracles. To the congregation for the causes of saints. That's right. Jesus, of the source of life, load out for souls, and the ocean of mercy open up for the whole world. O fountain of life, immeasurable divine mercy, cover the whole world and empty yourself out upon us. O blood and water, which flowed out from the heart of Jesus, the fountain of mercy for us, I trust in you. O holy God, holy mighty one, Holy Immortal One, have mercy on us and on the whole world. Holy God, Holy Mighty One, Holy Immortal One, have mercy on us and on the whole world. Holy God, Holy Mighty One, Holy Immortal One, have mercy on us and on the whole world. Amen. Jesus, King of Mercy, I trust in you. The Divine Mercy Chaplet. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women.
I want to talk to you about the difference between the saints who lived the divine will as Louisa did and the saints before this gift was actualized who did the divine will perfectly. Jesus makes a distinction between living in the divine will and doing the divine will. He tells her that the saints before this gift was actualized were perfectly disposed to receive it. But the gift was not yet given due to no defect of their own, like John the Baptist with the Eucharist. Okay. That's doing the divine will perfectly. Living the divine will is the fruit of the actualized gift that we are here addressing in this day of reflection. And I will use two mystical doctors that preceded Louisa that did not have this gift, and then Louisa and Hannibal, two that followed it, to show you the comparison between John of the Cross, Hannibal di Francia, Teresa of Avila, and Luisa Picaretta. I'm going to quote you from Teresa's work. She put out a beautiful work, two or three, The Way of Perfection, The Interior Mansions, and her memoirs. And she writes the following, taken from The Way of Perfection, Book 1, third, Article 30. Before I quote it, this is what you're going to hear from her. In heaven, everyone loves God continuously. There's no interruption. On earth, we cannot love him that way in spiritual marriage. It's similar, but not quite as continuous as in heaven. She writes, in heaven, all love him there, and the soul's concern is to love him. And this is how we should love him on earth, though we cannot do so with the same perfection and continuity. Now, Teresa of Avila is a mystical doctor, and she obtained spiritual marriage. The heights of what was available to her when she was alive. John confirms Teresa's experience. John of the Cross, from the living flame of love, stanza 1, articles 14 through 15. Even though a soul attains to as lofty a state of perfection in this mortal life as in spiritual marriage that we are discussing, the soul can neither nor does it reach the perfect state of glory in the next life. So it's clear in spiritual marriage, in the words of Teresa and John, that is not the same interior state as enjoyed by the blessed in heaven. In another work from John, he reinforces this. The spiritual canticle stands at 39, article 623. In the transformation that the soul possesses in this life, in spiritual marriage, the same spiration passes from God to the soul and from the soul to God, although not in the open and manifest degree proper to the next life. Spiritual marriage is not identical with the state of the blessed in heaven. It's close to it, but it's not with the same continuity or perfection. To Louisa, Jesus reveals that until the gift of living in the divine will was actualized in us, in the soul, the human creature could not participate in the same interior state as the blessed in heaven. December 6th, 1904, in volume 5. He tells her, I don't want souls that have given themselves completely to me and that I love in my will to wait to go to the beatific state when they go to heaven. I want it to begin on earth. I want to fill these souls not only with a heavenly bliss, but also with the bounty, the sufferings, and the virtue that my humanity possessed on earth. That is why I divest them not only of material desires, but also of the spiritual ones in order to fill them with my complete bounty, to give them the true beginning of beatitude. In volume seven, May 9th, 1907. My daughter, the blessed in heaven, give me much glory because of the, their perfect union with my will as their life is the product of my will in heaven. There is so much harmony between us that their breath, inhalation, movements, joys, and all that which constitutes their beatitude is the effect of my will. However, I tell you that for the soul who is still on earth and lives in my will in such a way that it never deviates from it, its life is heavenly. And I receive from the soul the same glory I receive from the blessed in heaven. Or rather, I take more pleasure and delight in this pilgrim soul on earth who lives in my will than from the blessed in heaven. Because what the blessed do, they do without sacrifice, 
and amid delights, whereas what this pilgrim soul does, it does with sacrifice and amid sufferings. And wherever there is sacrifice, I take more pleasure and I am more delighted. May 18th, 1915, volume 11. I place the souls who live completely in my will on earth in the same condition as the blessed in heaven. Now, John of the Cross and Teresa of Avila represent the apex of holiness before this gift was given. And that's why they are mystical doctors of the church. Louisa and Hannibal, who also received this gift, represent the apex of holiness of those who lived like John of the Cross, trees of Avila, but with this gift. It's the same interior state as the blessed in heaven. What does that mean? I mentioned earlier the difference between praying the rounds like Daniel and the psalmist and Louisa, being confined to time as opposed to transcending time and space. Suppose I go to a cemetery and there are 16,000 tombstones there, monuments, and I want to pray for everyone. How would I do it? I would have to walk to one monument, read the name, pray for that specific person, go to the next monument, read the name, pray. I wouldn't know who to pray for unless I stopped before each tombstone and saw who it is. That is the way the saints prayed before this gift was given. Linearly, as it were, with succession of time and acts. Within our bodies, after this gift is given to us, we still do our successive acts, but it is as if instead of walking from one monument to the other, I'm taken up in a plane. And I see all monuments with one bird's eye view from above. And if I have a bird's eye view, I can see it from above, their names and everything. That's how God sees all human generations. And that's how Jesus saw all of us in the Garden of Gethsemane. That's how Mary saw us at the Immaculate Conception. In the womb of Anne, she's beheld all of us, she says. God gave her this vision. And even though we may not possess this vision like them, we possess the ability to impact all creatures at once, as if we are, from an aerial view, praying for all generations from the first to the last. And not just all human generations, Jesus tells Louisa, we participate with the act of God creating the universe. How is this possible? How is it possible for me to impact someone whose judgment has already been passed that has died 3,000 years ago? This is how. If God can see everything from a bird's eye view, all human generations at once, what's to stop him from applying the prayers of someone who lives in the divine world today to someone who was conceived 3,000 years ago? He can apply our prayers to someone before we were even born. With God, there is no time. And he can apply our prayers today to someone who's not even conceived. And he can apply the prayers of someone not yet conceived to us right now. This is what's known as God's eternity. And this is the difference between praying in time and space and beyond it. The, the difference is infinite. You cannot compare it. That is why he tells Louisa that one act of Adam in the divine will before sin was greater than all the acts and prayers and sacrifices of saints combined. He tells her that Mary is greater than all angels and saints combined. Just one woman greater than all of them combined. That's quite a statement. Now Mary is the highest of all, higher than all creatures, higher than Joseph, higher than Adam, higher than Louisa. She is the mother and Jesus tells her no one can surpass or attain Mary's holiness. Nobody. That's created. Another example would be, suppose I wanted to preach to all the nations the gospel, like St. Paul. And what do I have at my disposal? A boat? I don't have a megaphone. I don't have the internet. So I have to go from one place to the other tell people to get together in an arena and try to convey this message to them. Now suppose I had the technology to communicate by way of intergalactical internet communication systems to all creatures of all the galaxies and billions of galaxies throughout the cosmos that are continuously expanding. And I said one word and everyone could hear it. <laughs> that is a pale example of what it's like to do one act in the divine will, which is like preaching to all the 
galaxy, the cosmos, as opposed to taking a boat and preaching from one place to the next. We cannot do this. God does it in us. Because when we ask God to flood us with his divine will, he does it all. If God did not give us this gift, we could pray as we might and it would never come. So it's not a virtue. A virtue means the more you do something, the closer you are to attaining it till you finally get there. Like an athlete. This is a gift. We did not merit it. We had been chosen for this time. And there's also going to be a persecution with it, so it kind of plays itself out. <laughs> but the beauty about it is that with God, we have nothing to fear. As St. John says, all love casts out fear. By the way, there was a artist who approached Pope Leo XIII, true story. And he presented him with a portrait of him, of Pope Leo. It didn't look anything like him. And the artist asked Leo to sign it, and he wrote at the bottom, Nulla temere ego sum in Latin. Fear not, it is I. <laughs> so we should have no fear despite what may happen because when God is in us, it casts out that kind of fear. There is a holy respect. Fear is a gift of the Holy Spirit, but it is not the kind of fear that makes you scared of a burglar breaking in. It's the kind of holy respect. I guess the way to best describe it is to not offend a parent that has high expectations or a loved one that thinks the world of you, don't want to let them kind of down. This is how we receive the gift, and God does it all in us. It's in four stages. The first stage is desire. Now, in desire, there is an implicit knowledge. It's not explicated. It's implicit, not explicit. It's, it's ingrained within us. It's a natural law, Thomas Aquinas calls it. So when you're young, right, why is it that you don't go up and blow up a bank if you're seven years old? You just know it's wrong, right? We don't kill our parents because it's against the intrinsic law God put within us. So if we should violate that, we sin. Even if we're not taught not to do it, it's still a sin because we are violating the voice of our conscience. People that kill in the name of God are violating that conscience too. Even though the person not, may not be taught or may be misinformed, it doesn't make it okay. Pope Ratzinger addressed this before he resigned. He said, ignorance is not bliss. That statement is wrong. He said, even if a woman commits abortion or someone does a crime and they didn't know it was against the church's law, they still sinned against their conscience before God. The degree of sin is modified because of their ignorance, but it's not completely taken away. So they may make it to heaven, but they still have to do their purgatory. Whereas if they knew it and did it, then they wouldn't make it to heaven without confessing it. But some element of guilt remains because God gave us this image and likeness within us. Certainly we can suffocate the voice of God, like these white slaves, they call them. They live in such a way, you know, the porn business, they live in such a way where, to them, killing or forcing someone to prostitution is nothing. Their conscience is dead. Does that mean that now since they're living in ignorance, all of their acts are not morally culpable? Of course not. They're violating that conscience. Desire gives us an implicit knowledge that God gives us, so we don't have to study books, it's just there. That is sufficient to desire God's will, and God will give it to you. Knowledge is the second step, where the more we learn about Louisa through her writings, or the writings of other mystics that speak of the divine will, the more we grow in it. Louisa's writings are the most formidable means to receive this gift through the greatest explication of knowledge. Not just receive it, but grow in it, I should say. Advance in it. Jesus gave Louisa a vision of objects in volume 11. Objects on the surface of the sea. She didn't say what the objects were. That had just penetrated the surface of the sea and began to sink. And others that had immersed themselves to the bottom of the sea floor. He said to her, you see these objects in the sea? She said, yes. They are all souls. They represent souls, all of whom live in my will. Some imperfectly others more perfectly, and others completely immerse themselves in me, come enter the center of my will. So you see, 
with the desire we can enter the divine will but be on the surface but we're still living in the divine will however imperfectly but with the knowledge of Louisa's writings we penetrate more deeply into those waters we advance and as I mentioned earlier Louisa received this gift at the age of 24 but did not enter into its center till the age of 35 Entering it is the most important thing. Of course, if you want to advance, that's even greater. Jesus tells Louisa, so much as one degree of advancement is incomprehensible to us. It makes all of heaven and creation rejoice for all eternity. One degree of advancement in the divine will is that important. It redoubles the creation of all creatures. The third step is virtue. So after we desire the divine will, be admitted to it, we grow in its knowledge so as to advance in it, and then we exercise the virtues so as to be anchored in it. We can enter the divine will and then leave, go in and out. This is what Louisa did for several years until she finally understood what it was and embraced it fully, never ever to leave it. And that was at the age of 24. But from 16 to 24, she was going in and out, learning lessons. And in order for us to enter, never to leave, virtue is what makes that possible. The exercise of virtue must be practiced, must be done. And he insists on Louisa repeating her acts, divine acts, doing her rounds every day, over and over and over, expressing her love in different ways to God, in and through creation, for the souls in purgatory, for the souls that are dying, thanking God for the angels. The more we exercise virtue, the more we develop a tempo. We're all creatures of habit. And the more we are faithful to that prayer pattern and work pattern, the less likely we will exit that gift of the divine will. What makes us leave the divine will is deliberate sin. If we commit a mortal sin, then we have to go to the sacrament of confession to go back into God's grace and then invoke the divine will again for him to give it to us again. And we can receive it immediately. We don't have to be a saint. But to remain in it, okay, we need to exercise the virtues. And final step is life. Once we've exercised the virtues, but we're anchored in the divine will, then it becomes actualized in us in its full capacity. So there's a gradation, but from stage to stage one, we're already participating in God's one eternal operation. And when we get to stage four, we're living in it, which implies continuity, never to leave. But even from the beginning, from desire, we're participating in that one eternal operation that impacts all creation, past, present, and future, concomitantly at the same time. So we can summarize these four stages as follows. Desire admits us to the gift. Knowledge advances us. Desire anchors us in it. And life actualizes it. So there are four A's. Admits, advances, anchors, and actualizes. Desire, knowledge, virtue, and life. The gift of living in the divine will brings with it a whole host of graces. I enumerate 33 in my dissertation. New graces. Jesus speaks of an unheard of chain of graces astonishing graces, never before heard of graces, almost eff continuously efficacious graces, unheard of wonders, unheard of prodigies, unheard of portents. That this long chain of graces that disposes us for the gift of the divine will accompanies us throughout life. This comes from volumes 11, September 6, 1913, volume 12, February 13, 1919, Volume 17, May 10th, 1925. The divine will imparts to the soul continuous growth. Volume 5, October 25th, 1903. Whereby the acts of man's finite being, our human acts, are absorbed, raised and transformed by God's eternal operation. This absorption is mentioned in June 30th, 1931, Volume 29. Raised and transformed by God's eternal operation is taken from volume 12, January 18, 1919. He gives her great graces, elucidated in volume 2, August 12, 1899. Adam was the first human son vested with our will. Jesus uses the word son a lot because in heaven there's uncreated light, which is part of God's being. It is God. When we say in the Nicene Creed, our faith, what do we say? Light from light, true God from true God. Think of that. God is uncreated light, inaccessible light. So he gives us the reflections of this light. 
So he says that Adam was the first human son vested with our will. He tells Louisa that in Eden, before original sin, Adam was clothed with the garment of light, and that when he sinned, this light receded within him, and he found himself exposed. Gregory of Nyssa, St. Basil's brother from the 4th century, says the same thing. After sin, this light receded within him. And Jesus tells Louisa on two occasions he expressed this light, but throughout his entire earthly existence he refrained it. At the birth of our Lord, when the crib was illuminated, and at the transfiguration. That is what Adam looked like before sin, what Jesus looked like, like at the transfiguration. He literally glowed as, as, as like an alabaster vase with a light in it. The divinity coming out of his humanity. If you study iconography of the East, of the Russians in particular, or the masters of iconography, you will see in the icons illumination from their orifices, their ears, their eyes, their nostrils, their mouths, light coming out because they contain the divinity within. Adam didn't just emit light, his whole body was surrounded with it. And uh, when he sinned, he lost that and he tells Louisa he felt embarrassed because the animals saw that he was the only one there without light and he felt ashamed and had to cover himself. So the first sacrifice ever done in the history of mankind was probably done by God. Who clothed Adam and Eve with the animal's skins? In any event, he tells Louisa, Adam, Adam was the first human son vested with our will, and his acts were greater than the sun's rays. For they extended and expanded with the aim of vesting the entire human family whereby one might see the many in the one as though pulsating within these rays and all of their acts concent concentrated in the center of the first human son and all were to have the power of forming their own sons without going out of the bond of the first son how beautiful was man's creation oh how he surpassed the entire universe the bond of the one, of the union of the one and the many, was the greatest prodigy of our omnipotence, as our will, one in itself, maintained this inseparability and the communicating and unifying life of all creatures. Our cre uncreated love was infused in created man, and our will, which is the sole operation in us, was to be the sole operator in man with the purpose of establishing in him the unity of all things and the bond of inseparability of each and every creature. Here he's telling us that Adam was the emulsifying agent between the cosmos. He kept everything in harmony and order. And when he sinned, things went into a state of anarchy and chaos and disorder. Adam was the glue because of his acts. And this is what our acts do. They help reestablish relations between creatures, harmony and unity. In Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 8, he says, All creation groans with eager longings, waiting to be set free from its slavery to corruption, in expectation of the sons of God. Because the sons of God will set creation free from its slavery to corruption. It is my conviction that Paul was referring to us. The sons of God, in my opinion, refer especially to those who live in the divine will. They will set creation free from its slavery to corruption. By doing our rounds throughout creation, we help reestablish our relations of harmony in the universe that original sin disrupted. Because with original sin, thistles grew and beasts became wild. It was the first natural disaster. The book of Genesis relates that. As soon as Adam sinned, the beast turned wild and thistles grew and there was man suffered, the sweat of his brow, woman had childbearing pains and so forth. And then there were taxes. <laughs> wow. He didn't see that one coming. <laughs> Cause-effect relationship of sin and natural disaster. This was the first natural disaster in human history original sin. Therefore, the more we sin, the more nature rebels against us, as I mentioned earlier. It's quite obvious. And the more we turn to God, you'll see. The more nature will go back to its place and establish relations of harmony and order with the universe and with us. 
it is incumbent upon us to do our divine acts like Jesus did by desiring it learning more and more about knowing it exercising the virtues and attaining life in the divine will Jesus also tells Louise I'll conclude with this he speaks to her about a priesthood in the, of the kingdom of the divine will he tells Louisa <clears throat> on January 18, 1928, volume 23, informing the new church, I form the new priesthood that does not detach itself from scripture or the gospel contained therein. All priests were devoted to them in order to instruct the people. And it can be said that anyone who should refuse to draw from these salutary funds of the scriptures and the priesthood does not belong to me because they are the basis of my church and the very life with which I form people. Now, what I manifest on my divine will and that which you write may be called the gospel of the kingdom of the divine will. In nothing does it oppose either sacred scripture or the gospel contained therein that I announced on earth. On the contrary, they complement each other. And this is why I allow and call priests to come to read the gospel of the kingdom of my divine fiat that is imbued with heaven so that, so that I may say to them as I said to the apostles preach it to all the world indeed I carry out my works through the priesthood just as there was the priesthood of the Old Testament this is the key part namely the Levitical priesthood the priesthood of my church in order to confirm my coming and everything I didn't said namely the ministerial ordained priesthood so there will be the priesthood of the kingdom of my will. Hmm, what is that? My daughter, it is of great necessity that the first priests be formed, as they will serve me as the apostles serve me to form my church. And those who will occupy themselves with these, these writings in order that they may be published, who properly make them known so that they may be printed, will be the new evangelists of the kingdom of my supreme will. So he goes on and on. The point here is, Adam and Eve, as I mentioned earlier, participated in what I called and what Bar or as von Balthasar refers to as the Adamic priesthood. The Adamic priesthood was the plan A priesthood priesthood of Adam. It is what the Second Vatican Council, in my opinion, refers to as the common priesthood. The Second Vatican Council created a term for a priesthood of the laity. They called it the common priesthood. So we have the Second Vatican Council says, all the baptized partake of the common priesthood of Christ whereby they exercise the Christ's office of uh, pr prophet, priest, king, where he teaches and instructs, sanctifies through prayer, sanctifies through sacrifice. All laity can do that. But then there's the ministerial priest, just for men. Sorry, ladies. That offer up, consecrate the body and blood, absolve from sin, which the common priesthood cannot do, And the reason for this is because Genesis chapter 2, verse 16. Adam sinned, and his sin infected the human race with original sin. Even though Eve sinned first, Adam was the head of the human race, and when the head was infected, the whole body was infected. So since sin came into the world through man, it has to be expiated through man. That is why Jesus took upon himself a male human nature. He was the new Adam.